and his goal of making legal education reach marginalized communities and to every and every and every corner and every corner of this country the idea is to create leaders and not followers access must be created where it is possible and there are small things each of us can do it aims at the project aims at providing free training for law aspirant for all law entrance examination at present uh, we are in this particular session we are going to talk about uh, space missions and today we have with us avinav singh negi who has been taking current affairs sessions for project maverick the space session the space missions have uh, have attracted quite quite a number of youth in this coming time and elon musk launching some some major projects across and uh, then we also understand that uh, these projects are ongoing and uh, these two names rather every would uh, every aspirant would have heard is isro and nasa so we will understand more about these space missions over to you negi sir hey guys um, so today i want to talk to you about space space missions in general so i'll be breaking this video into two parts the first part would necessarily focus on like indian space missions and what isro has done till now and what isro plans to do in the future and towards the end of the video i will talk to you about some space missions that are being carried on by sister agencies of the isro in the sense that other like other country space faring organizations right so why this topic becomes very important is because over the last one one and a half years there's been a lot of um let's say it's 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 caught on to the public imagination right space is now the final frontier that humanity wants to capture and it's not it's not fiction anymore right it's not only in the books that you can think about visiting mars or visiting the moon right these things are becoming a reality india also tried to land on the moon then india also had a mom or the mangal orbiter mission and so these things are becoming a reality and india is not the only country there are three four other countries that have already achieved these feats and now by and large if you if you follow the news generally if you looked at the budget speech recently you would have figured that under the atmanirbhar bharat project also indian government decided that we'll open up the space sector for private sector for we'll open up the space sector for private sector explorations so we can pretty much say that we are entering into this era of space exploration in a big way right so apart from focusing on so most of the video today will deal with basically what's the contemporary space missions that are being carried forward however if you look at your clad current affairs syllabus it also mentions a headline which it also has a subheading which says historical events which can with continuing significance right so in that light i will also discuss with you some important space missions that had started in the 70s 80s and some of them which have started in the 90s because although they are not like fairly current centric but you have to know about these missions because these missions generally lay the groundwork for how far humanity has come with vis-a-vis -vis space exploration okay so this video will not include topics about space particularly i will not be discussing with you what are black holes what are the latest let's say our discoveries about black holes or what is gravitational lensing etc these i believe are very interesting topics obviously but i think they are beyond the scope of your syllabus because as a 17 18 year olds most of you will not possess the technical knowledge to understand these things and therefore i don't think that there will be questions coming out of it and moreover since it's an objective type exam it's it's not really important to focus largely on those concepts right so in this video i have tried to basically compile all the data from january 2019 to may 2020 so once you are through with this video i don't think you need to read again about space missions everything and anything that is covered here your paper will most likely be out of this and if there are questions that are beyond this then it's not worth it right because you don't really have that kind of time to keep reading on some very specific things in the hope that this might come in your paper so please focus on this video and obviously you can obviously update it because my data is fresh up until may end so maybe whatever happens in the next two or three months you just need to supplement your preparation with that so having said that let's just start with space missions india and the world so the first thing that i want to talk to you about is obviously the gaganyaan project it's a fairly popular project that you must have heard of so gagan gaganyaan mission is basically a mission that is planned by isro the idea is to have a crewed orbital spacecraft one second let me just adjust this one second yeah is to have a 
crewed orbital spacecraft, which is expected to carry about three people into the space. And the duration of this mission would be around seven days. So if that happens correctly, and if there are no hiccups in this mission, India will become the fourth country to send a man into space. And this mission was announced in 2018, and the preparations right now are in full swing. And if you pick up newspapers, you will on and off, let's say once in 15, 20 days, read some article about the Gaganya mission. Now, to take, to take forward the Gaganyan mission, ISRO has signed a pact with this Russian firm called Glass Cosmos to select and train astronauts for Gaganyan project. So the names that I'll be throwing in, in this video, right, just let's say, let's say NASA, GLONASS, etc. These are very important names because it is very likely that these names could come in the form of fill in the blanks in your exams. And you'll be, and you'll have to guess some of these names. So please pay close attention to these names. These slides will obviously also be shared with you and please try to keep them in mind. So the astronauts for the Gaganyan mission are basically as of now, they're Indian Air Force pilots whose training is going on in Russia under the ages of this company, Glav Cosmos. Obviously, since this is the first manned mission that India is planning, our currently their training is going on in Russia, but obviously into the future, India plans to conduct more space-based missions and wants to send more people to space. And therefore it is mooting to set up a manned flight center in Bangalore. We'll be reading about it towards the end of this video. Okay. Um, so apart from cooperation with this firm called Glav Cosmos, we will also have the assistance of this French space agency called CNES. So just like we have our ISRO and the US has its NASA, there is a French space agency called as CNES. And it's basically going to give us and provide us expertise in the field of space medicine, astronaut health monitoring, radiation protection, and life support. So these are things that ISRO has been working on, but ISRO obviously has not been able to, let's say, reach its zenith of capability here. And obviously we need some foreign help. And this is being provided to us by France. And if time permits, someday I'll backtracking since international relations is also fairly important and we've covered india china and india nepal relations we'll also probably at some point of time look at india france relations because over the over the last six seven months there have been a lot of things that have happened between india and france which have made the india france relations a key focus of current affairs preparation and i predict that there is most likely going to be one paragraph out of india france relations anyways we'll cover that later coming back to the gaganyan project now, ISRO also plans to have two unmanned Gaganyan flights, right? Obviously, you can't just randomly send a first flight into the space, right? So you have two unmanned flights, one by December 2020, which is end of this year, and then the other by mid-2021, before having the under the manned mission by December 2021. So it's fairly close. Now very important thing that you have to know here is that the launch vehicle that will be used is the GSLV, Geostationary Launch Vehicle, MK3. So it's the latest version and it's a three-stage heavy lift launch vehicle. This is some technical detail, but you should know that the GSLV MK3 is the biggest launch vehicle that India has and it is capable of carrying around 5,000 uh, kgs of payload to the lower or earth, low earth orbit and about sorry to, to the geostationary orbit and about 10,000 kgs of payload to the low earth orbit right so it's a massively expensive project and GSLV MK3 is basically the launch vehicle this, this is also the launch vehicle that is being used by ISRO to put for put a lot of friendly nation space satellite space satellites into space and also a lot of other satellites so GSLV MK3 is a name that you should remember and it has the distinction of being the workhorse of the ISRO. Okay. Now, now obviously Gaganyan is not the first time that there has been a planned mission, a manned mission to the moon, sorry, manned mission to space. Now Gaganyan is now the fourth mission, right? And sorry, fifth mission, it would be the fifth mission. Um, so Gaganyan would obviously be smaller in size than the current Russian Soyuz is one aircraft that is used to carry people into space. Then you have the Chinese Shenzhou and NASA's planned Orion spacecraft. So the Gaganyan is smaller than all of these. Okay. Now that's pretty much it that you need to know about the Gaganyan mission. There is something other, other things related to the Gaganyan mission. I will be focusing on it towards the end of this video because it's better to place those things there. Now, the second topic that I want to discuss with you is the Chandrayaan-2 mission. Now, obviously, Chandrayaan-2 mission is something that's been on the news and we've 
keenly been following it obviously when the rover did not land on mars but not land on the moon it obviously broke everyone's heart but let's look at let's try to understand why the chandrayaan 2 mission was carried forward and what is the chandrayaan 3 mission that is carrying up coming up and what was the chandrayaan mission 1 to which the chandrayaan 2 mission was a follow up for okay so is so obviously as we know launched the chandrayaan mission to moon in july but its lander failed to reach the lunar surface right uh, it was launched by the gslv mk3 m1 launch vehicle so this is the workhorse of the isro this is the uh, launcher which is able to carry the heaviest load designed by isro okay now it is india's so this launcher is obviously india's most powerful launcher to date etc etc and it's been basically it's completely indigenous we have not imported anything including the engine for this launcher okay now there are there were three important components in the chandrayaan 2 mission the first is obviously the orbiter now as the name is fairly suggested the orbiter's role was to observe the lunar surface while being in the orbit and relay communication between earth and chandrayaan 2's lander right so obviously the orbiter is still in place because orbiter didn't crash only the lander and the rover crashed right so when we have the chandrayaan 3 mission they will obviously not send an orbiter because the orbiter is already in place therefore chandrayaan 3 mission will be cheaper than the chandrayaan 2 mission now after the orbiter you have a lander called vikram and this was designed to execute india's first soft landing on the lunar surface now obviously that landing didn't happen we almost reached the surface and the landing is going perfectly but maybe in the last few kilometers there were certain issues then the lander's job is obviously to land on the surface and then after that you have the rover which is called pragyan now rover is basically like a robot that they'll which is a wheel robot that they will use they would have the plan was to use it to carry let's say some sort of testing etc on the moon surface and carry for and perform some on site chemical analysis right now obviously if successful india would have become the fourth country ever to soft land on the lunar surface after usa ussr which is also well russia and china right so before the chandrayaan 2 mission there was this um, private no, there was a st- private space a startup of sorts in israel that had tried to attempt a soft landing on the moon this is probably 6 7 months before our mission but that also failed right so as of now only three countries have achieved that feat now let's look at why the chandrayaan 2 went into space right there it it there would have obviously been enormous amounts of planning and there has to obviously be a reason for chandrayaan 2 going into space right you can't just spend cro- thousands of crores of rupees and send probes to like distant objects right so chandrayaan 1 was launched in india in october 2009 this was launched by using an older form of vehicle called pslv c11 this is not very relevant for you now you have to understand the your what is important for you is what was the major findings of the chandrayaan 1 right so in its first thing chandrayaan 1 did was it detected that there was some water which was in the form of h2o and then you had hydroxyl ions which are oh negative ions on the surface of the moon right so this data that was collected by the orbiter of the chandrayaan 1 mission revealed the presence of water around the polar regions right and therefore chandrayaan to aim to be the first space mission to conduct a soft landing on the moon south pole region so the reason why the south pole region of the moon was chosen was because after studies conducted by chandrayaan 1 there was fair enough evidence to conclude that the highest probability or chances of finding traces of water on the moon would be in either of the poles okay now there is obviously so the area in the south pole that remains in the shadow is greater than the area in the north pole which remains in the shadow therefore the probability of finding water in some form of stable form is higher in the south pole right and that is the reason why chandrayaan 2 decided to land in the south pole now additionally there are certain craters in the south pole which are cold traps and they could contain fossil records of the early solar system right so we could it could fundamentally so if this mission had been carried forward successfully and if our ro- if our rover had been able to have or conduct some form of proper on site chemical analysis by going into these cold traps and deep craters it could have fundamentally altered the understanding of the solar system that we have right so there are a lot of things that humanity has really progressed in we understand a lot of things we are very close to having a cure for the corona virus in the form of a vaccine there is basically not a lot of phenomena left in the world that is not understood and conquered by science however there is one department in which humanity is understanding is very limited and that is vis-a-vis the form mission and the origin and the chemical properties of the universe so had this rover landed successfully it could have 
basically put out more shadow and it it could, it could have put away the shadow so to speak it could have given more clarity on the origins of the moon and the solar system in general right so after the second after the failure of chandrayaan 2 mission obviously the government is not that deterred and chandrayaan 3 mission which is the third lunar mission has been approved so just like chandrayaan 2 it will aim to act, land at the lunar south pole and this will cost our government about 600 crore rupees so please keep these figures in mind 600 crore rupees thousands of crore rupees because these are these will very become very important when i talk about the government's initiative to have private sector investment in the space exploration right so one of the best things if if private sector exploration if private sector is permitted to enter into space exploration is that the reliance of space missions space missions on government funding could be reduced so you could have private enterprises putting in money in the hopes of profit in space exploration and the government could probably use these 600 crore rupees to let's say have better educational facilities to let's say feed millions of people that go hungry in our country right so there will be a more effective allocation of resources so now coming to the third topic that i want to cover this is navic okay so navic basically stands for navigation in the indian constellation it is an indian regional navigation satellite system irnss developed by isro so why navic is very important is because all of you i'm assuming since you're watching this on laptops you are fairly familiar with gps right so let's say if you have to go anywhere today nobody stops on the road shut lowers down the window and asks people the direction right the easiest way to do it is to type on your google maps and then google maps uses this software or the navigation system called gps right so gps navic is to india what gps is to usa so just like so usa has developed this global positioning system india is also trying to develop its own navigation system called the navic okay so the indian regional navigation satellite system it consists of eight satellites and it works just like the gps system however it only works within 1500 km radius over the subcontinent right so gps by its name is fairly clear that it stands for a global positioning system now obviously india does not have that kind of money and we don't really need systems to let's say map like south america or mexico like it's not of any strategic importance to us our resources limit us to basically have a system of eight satellites which will work within which will establish which will map or yeah which will basically map a 1500 km radius over the indian subcontinent right so there is isro and then you have its commercial arm called the antrix corporation limited and these are basically the two entities that are set to commercialize navic so there is a body called the global standards body called the 3gpp which develops exactly Also, which develops protocols for mobile telephony right now for gps for example to become an integrated and essential component of our android or apple mobiles or whatever you may have you have to get the approval of the 3gpp now gps obviously had gotten the approval a while ago now this 3gpp has also given the approval for in for the india's regional navigation system or the navic so what basically now it mean it means is that manufacturers can now mass produce navigation devices which are compatible to navic and then these devices can easily access navic signals so maybe in future 2 3 years from now you will not really have to rely on gps and you might if you want to this is basically also another step in atmanirbhar bharat right because to tell you directions you would really don't need a us satellite you can have you can rely on satellites that are launched by your own country right so the important thing here is that there is navic the other important thing here is that it works only in the indian subcontinent within a 1500 km radius and the third important thing is that there is isro which is the hardcore government organization and it has its commercial arm called the antrix cooperation we'll discuss a little more about the antrix cooperation and another uh, commercial arm of this so a bit later towards this end of this video what you also should remember is just like there is navic from india there is gps from the usa there are other navigational satellite systems which you should remember for example the chinese system is called baidu then you have galileo which is the european system then the japanese system is qzss then you have glonass by russia and obviously gps by the united states of america <clears throat> yeah now another important 
thing that happened recently is that india has now come up with its plan to have its own space to space tracking and communication of its space assets by this year right so basically what has now happened is that india has become fairly proficient in launching its a its own satellites and then satellites of other friendly nations as well right so now india is saying that instead of relying on nasa's data or instead of relying on friendly countries to track or maintain links with our own satellites because we have a sufficient number of satellites that we've also put up in space let's have a system of our own and this system is called the idrss or the indian data relay satellite system okay now the idea is to have a set of two st such satellites which will enable satellite to satellite communication and transfer to transfer of data amongst the indian satellites right so one of the advantages would be that it will obviously track send and receive signals and in time information and real time information from other indian satellites particularly with those satellites that are on a low earth orbit which will basically mean that if there are multiple low earth orbit satellites and you have a in, if you have an idrss satellite high up in the atmosphere high up in space in higher orbits then they can increase the outreach of these lower uh, orbit satellites by magnifying the signals that they're sending out okay now this will obviously also tie in with the gaganyaan mission because the primary aim is to track satellites and other objects in space now obviously this would then be very beneficial and important for the crew members of the gaganyaan mission because it will help in having a smoother mission control throughout the mission okay now as of now our limitation as it, as of now our planning is limited to only gaganyaan mission but if you have such satellite linkages then obviously maybe in future if we want to let's say have perform space talking maneuvers because i'll be talking to you towards the end of this video that india just like india is also planning its own space station along the lines of the international space station right so one of the most important things that you have to do there is to navigate your satellites to properly dock in with the space station right so this will obviously help there then if let's say india wants to send further probes to the moon to mars venus and india has also decided to launch a or launch a mission to study the corona of the sun right called the aditya mission we'll talk about it a little later so it will obviously help india to conduct this sort of mission and it will make coordination and mission control far easier than what it than it is today right so obviously then it will also reduce the dependence on ground stations in tracking satellites because you would basically have two large satellite monitoring stations up in the space now after so india will launch the first satellite by 2020 so end of this year and the second one by 2021 so after that we'll be fairly proficient in tracking our own satellites and india will join us china japan and europe in the league of nations who already have such systems okay now another thing that i want to discuss in which is very important is a satellite launched by india called the cartosat so cartography if you are fairly familiar with geography is basically refers to the art of making or studying maps right so you can very well guess what cartosat satellite's purpose would be so isro has successfully launched the cartosat 3 and other 13 small nano satellites from the satish dhawan space center in shri harikota so one of the reasons i mentioned with space station it is launched for is because you should obviously know that there is this space center called satish dhawan space center in shri harikota which is primarily where most of the launches that are conducted by isro take off from okay now cartosat satellites as i explained as i as i hinted in the beginning are basically earth observation satellites that are mainly used for large scale mapping of the earth through high resolution cameras so it's fairly obvious what these are it's not a need there's not a need for a lot of explanation but obviously there are multiple uses that you can have if you have your own indigenous satellite which can map the earth or not forget the earth which can map your country properly and you can also have high resolution cameras to give you real time data right and obviously if you start thinking about it there is a lot of things that these cartosat satellites can help you with they can help you with large scale urban planning rural and infrastructure development coastal land use and land cover etc you can detect in real time if your forest cover is increasing or not you can detect and monitor state government policies let's say government of india gives a directive to the countries to the states that you have to increase our forest cover to be in line with the sort of commitments that we've made under the paris agreement then obviously that sort of monitoring can easily be conducted by these high resolution cameras now it obviously has a lot of 
uses in disaster management support programs like cyclone and flood mapping there let's say there's a landslide on landslide mapping agriculture drought mapping forest fires earthquakes surveillance etc right so this can have implications all over there and as i think we've discussed in one of the videos india okay not in these videos but there's another set of videos that i take so basically sorry sorry for that so basically india is also let's say the regional head so the reach sark regional self center for Uh, disaster management is also located in india right so india so carto site 3 is not just for india it is also india's gift to basically all its friendly sub countries right because if let's say there are earthquakes in nepal or floods in bangladesh then obviously india through its carto site 3 satellite would share adequate data for with it, with these friendly countries so carto site satellite 3 also has good and beneficial implications for india's foreign policy then obviously because you have high resolution cameras it is obviously expected to also help in military reconnaissance and mapping pro issues um so another very interesting topic that i want to talk to you about is cleaning up space debris so if you've been following the news you would have realized that last year india did something spectacular india conducted a test wherein it destroyed a dysfunctional satellite so the test was basically to test india's capability to be able to destroy enemy satellites in space in terms of act active war right so the primary criticism for that test which was conducted by india was that there is already a large problem of free floating debris in space and such a test wherein a missile was launched on the surface of the earth and it blew up a satellite in space would obviously add to these space debris now let me this will tell you how serious of an issue <coughs> a space debris is right so as of now so there is a program called the harpoon program which is basically a part of this a multinational effort as uh, to clear this space junk okay so it is a part of this larger project known as the remove debris project which is a multi organization european effort as of now to create and test methods to reduce space debris right because obviously as more and more countries become space faring nations and we rely on we are in our reliance on let's say space increases for telecommunication disaster management etc it's ob fairly obvious that more and more countries would want to put in more more and more satellites and now satellites have been launched for the last 30 40 50 years and obviously there are certain old and defunct satellites in the space which are serving no purpose they are taking up crucial orbital space right so obviously you want to clean up those debris because cleaning up those debris would make make that make sure it would ensure that you will have safer launches in future and the cost of uh, launches would also be much cheaper right so let's look at the size of this problem in space right so nasa estimates that there are about 5 lakh pieces of debris which are larger than half an inch in low orbit so is say buddy there are 5 lakh debris now this might sound very small to you but imagine the velocity at which these debris are going around the earth right so there is a fixed as in there is a fixed amount of velocity that you have to have otherwise you would start collapsing towards the other right? otherwise the gravitational pull will take over and the tangential force that your velocity is exerting will not be powerful enough and obviously then the object will start falling towards the earth surface now these objects are in orbit therefore these objects are at very high velocity sometimes up to 30000 kilometers an hour so even if you if you pick up this phone and somehow put this phone in space and if this is traveling at 30000 kilometers per hour just imagine the sort of damage this phone can cause to any of the other satellites which anyways cost thousands of crores to put up there okay so so these are some efforts so, so the removed debris project is an effort which is made by european countries japan has launched launched its indigenous satellites called satellite called the konotori 6 satellite which basically uses half a mile long tether matlab ek rassi use karte hain to remove some debris from the earth's orbit right now similarly a team of isro is also working to set up an observatory to track this space junk right so we have developed an indigenous radar radar called the multi object tracking radar which is again developed by the satish dhawan space center in sri harikota which allows isro to track 10 objects simultaneously so a it tracks india's space assets now obviously once you have 
the other program that idrss program that i spoke to you about it will, that will be used to track space assets anyways now the motr will be used to track space debris right so up and until 2016 when the motr was developed by the satish dhawan center we had to completely rely on data and coordination by nasa to launch our satellites right because you obviously have to track the space debris if you are planning to launch your own satellite you can't launch satellite blindly you can't spend like 2000 crore rupees to launch a satellite only to be brought down by an object the size of a mobile phone so obviously you have to have knowledge about the exact geospatial positioning of these debris so until 2016 we had we are completely reliant on nasa but now we have our motr data by which we can have sufficient proficiency and independence in deciding when and where to launch our own satellites okay now another thing that i want to talk to you about is about private sector in space act activities right so atmanirbhar bharat abhiyan is now the new buzzword that has come along after the lockdown um so obviously the government of india under atmanirbhar bharat decided that obviously the role of private sector in india has to in space exploration and space program has to be increased they have to give further impetus to uh, put private sector in satellites in in let's say launching activities and other space based activities right so obviously government of india has done this in tandem with isro because if you look at isro's activity in the recent years isro is glo is gradually warming up to the idea of private participation in space exploration right they say for example isro recently opened up its facilities for private players by which includes helping a consortium of companies to build a polar satellite launch vehicle right so pslv is the prime is an older version of launch vehicles so the cutting edge vehicles are your gslv mk3 vehicle which use tech engine technologies like cryotech engine which not which only three four countries can make so isro is opening it's obviously isro is not going to share that sort of a data because those cryotech engines can then be used to manufacture any let's say form of supersonic missiles and which would be detrimental to the national security of any country and the world generally would not be really happy and nobody shares that kind of technology with each other right so isro will help private players develop their own pslv sort of launch vehicles right and then there are future projects for planetary exploration outer space travel etc outer space tra tourism might become a thing right and obviously you know if you have government agencies in charge of tourism then you really know what kind of it really doesn't work right so obviously if space tourism is going to become a thing in future it's better to have the private sector take care of that because that's not a necessary sovereign function which the state with such limited state capacity as india has should anyways be taking part in right so the idea is generally to open space exploration because there is a large aspect of space per se which can be successfully privatized and which will not have any sort of detrimental effort, uh, effect on national security etc right so keeping in line with this the government has also announced that there would be a predictable policy and a regulatory environment which is predictable will be ensured so in 2017 government of india came up with a draft space law now i don't want to discuss the draft space law with you because the clad consortium which is going to set your paper in a circular has easily clarified that there might be discussed on basically on current affairs there might be some laws or bills that might be discussed in your passages but your knowledge of law will should as in it will not test your knowledge of law beyond what is mentioned in those passages right so then i think it's self defeating for me to spend some time here and talk to you about the draft space law if you really want to if you are really interested you can read it however trust me if there's a question on the draft space law it won't be beyond the comprehension that is given there they won't ask you technical details about india's draft space law in a clat exam right now <clears throat> keeping in line with allowing in allowing the private sector to participate isro has identified 17 technologies and has invited researchers to develop these at lower cost for its gaganyaan mission right so gaganyaan mission obviously one of the priorities of the government is to make sure that the gaganyaan mission is a low cost venture because in a country like india where there are 30 crore kids which are underfed and they are stunted it's obviously not the correct thing for government to focus on say space exploration so obviously by and large over a period of time the government wants to diversify the participants in its space programs and wants to shift the financial burden to the private sector okay so these 70 technologies are basic technologies like food and medicine for astronauts or space voyages space suits 
you have inflatable habitats anti radiation and thermal protection technologies etc so basic important stuff which isro should not be wasting money on and the private sector has enough capability and capital to come up with solutions for these right so in light of this isro has inaugurated in light of private sector participation in space activity isro has launched its commercial arm called new space india limited so nsil in bangalore a bangalore actually to scale up the industry participation in indian space program so remember i had talked to you about the antrix um lim corporation limited which was one commercial wing of the isro and then you have the second commercial wing of the isro called the nsil i'll talk about both in detail but the primary difference here is that antrix corporation has mainly foreign focus because it will be used to let's say launch foreign satellites etc and your nsil will have a more domestic focus right so these are the to so th this is this is how these two companies are intended to function and antrix corporation is very old in fact in 2008 itself it had attained a mini ratna status okay so now coming to another very interesting thing or development that has taken place in india space program this is about india's own space mission so isro has announced an ambitious plan to put up a space station in the next decade so probably by the end of 2030 india might have its own space station right and why the timing of this space station is very important is because in the next few years the international space station will is going to be decommissioned and therefore there would be a need for space station to conduct experiments in microgravity etc now the chinese obviously are also planning their own space station i obviously don't remember the chinese name but the literal translation is basically like heaven in space or something like that you can probably google about it so just like china india also now plans to have its own space station now this indian space station will obviously be much smaller only 20 tons than the international space station and it will be used for carrying out microgravity experiments and not for space tourism so for example international space center is now opening up for space tourism to let's say kind of make up for the money that has been put in for its development right so the preliminary plan as of now that exists is for this indian space station to have astronauts for up to 20 days in space and this project will obviously be an extension of the gaganyaan mission right because it is obviously a logical conclusion of the gaganyaan mission if you can send a man to space then what do you do after that you obviously use that man slash woman that you send in space to obviously then conduct experiments in microgravity etc maybe have some sort of invention that can benefit the whole of humanity right so you just won't put someone in space and then forget about it it has to obviously be carried to its logical conclusion and the logical conclusion is to have an indian space station where astronauts which are launched into the space by future gaganyaan missions can actually dock and spend some time in the indian space station and conduct a lot of experiments right so obviously it will be in a low earth orbit at around the height of 400 kilometers so iss currently international space station is the only active space station in the earth's orbit is going to be decommissioned very soon and obviously you would need other space stations so one thing that you should know about the international space station is that it's a joint project between five participating agencies nasa of the us then you have roscosmos of russia jaxa of japan esa european space agency of europe and canadian space agency csa canada okay so these are the main isro missions however there are certain other important isro missions which don't as in i can't devote that much time into telling about these missions in particular but these are also fairly important right so first is the aditya mission if you know a little bit of hindi aditya is also prayavachi for sun so it's fairly clear what the aditya l1 mission is about so it is a mission which isro plans to put out in 2021 to study the solar corona or the outer bright layer of the sun right so this would be isro's first scientific experiment expedition to study the sun and this will be launched early next year so early 2021 is the launch plan for that so you should basically know aditya l1 mission is related to studying the sun then similarly you have the astrosat mission okay now this is important because it is the first indian multi wavelength space observatory which completed 4 years in orbit in september 2019 that's not important what is important is it's seen as a smaller version of nasa's hubble space telescope right so the largest space telescope that there a large space telescope by telescope by the name of the hubble space telescope was put in by nasa in the space to study the uh, the cosmos right and india also had its own smaller version which was known as astrosat 
then you have a geo imaging satellite gisat1 which is an indian earth observatory satellite obviously to basically observe the indian subcontinent better and it will help in disaster management activities right so then you have a very important project called the nisar project so nisar stands for nasa isro synthetic aperture radar now this is a joint project project between nasa and isro now the so basically the aim of nisar is to study the impact of global environment changes and climate change and therefore it is designed to take measurements of the most complex phenomena on the planet like ecosystem disturbances because these require a lot of data these require a lot of imaging and these require a lot of precision therefore nasa and isro have come together to get, to have this project nisar so this is very important you should know project nisar is a collaboration between nasa and isro and secondly it it is basically a project to study the long term implications of global warming and climate change okay then you have the shukrayaan 1 now it is a mission that isro plans to launch by mid 2023 to study venus then similarly you have mangalyaan 2 then just like mangalyaan 1 mangalyaan 2 is an interplanetary mission that isro plans for mars okay then um, coming back to the human space flight center hsfc remember i had talked to you about the fact that indian air force pilots are being trained for the gaganyaan mission in russia now obviously once this mission is successful we will not stop and we will obviously have further manned mission and the training for those manned missions would now not be conducted in Chen in russia It would be conducted in chalakeri in karnataka so isro is mooting the idea of setting up the human space flight center there right um then obviously there is another cooperation that i talked about after the antrix cooperation i talked about the new space india limited so it, the establishment was announced in 2019 budget and the one of the mandates of the nsil IL is to mass produce and manufacture sslv and the more powerful pslv right so obviously M gslv the government will not share the technology but there are two other platforms of launching the vehicle the the one in the middle called the pslv and the most important here is the sslv which is basically small satellite launch vehicle right so as of now it takes about let's say 70 to 80 days to get a gslv type of launcher and then you have to have massive coordination amongst countries as to when they want to send satellites right so what india plans is that it's isro wants to capitalize on the fact that it can create and it can put out small scale cheap launch launch vehicles right so the benefit of sslv is that one sslv can be ready in about 70 to 74 hours so let's say it takes 3 days to get ready to get an sslv ready and it will take about 70 to 80 days approximately 2 and a half months to get a gslv ready right so isro wants private sector to come in to mass produce and manufacture slv sslv and pslv type of launchers right so as i told you initially how it differs from isro's existing commercial arm the antrix corporation is that antrix focuses mainly on commercial deals for satellites and launch vehicles with foreign countries and nsil will deal with capacity building of local industries and for mass production and space manufacturing okay so guys up until now we've basically covered what india has done what india plans to do for its space missions now let's quickly have a look at the global space mission right so let's so for the first mission that i want to talk to you about briefly is the changi 4 mission it is a chinese mission which was the first to land successfully on the far side of the moon right so there is so if you study a little bit of geography and if you remember moon is tidally locked with the sun right so moon so type being tightly locked means that the amount that the amount of time that it takes for the moon to complete one revolution around the earth is also the same there is also the time that the moon takes to complete one rotation around the earth right so therefore because of the moon being tightly locked with the earth we are only able to see one phase or one face or one side of the moon the other side of the moon which we have never been able to see is called the far side or the dark side of the moon there's a transformers movie also transformers dark side of the moon where they say that aliens have landed etc anyways going off track basically sorry so you have the chinese changi 4 mission wherein they land on landed on the far side of the moon and conducted whatever research they wanted to then you have as a and after that the chinese decided to launch a changi 5 mission now the idea is to have a robotic chinese lunar exploration mission consisting of a lander and a sample return vehicle so they want to bring back rock samples etc from the moon and this is scheduled for launch any time in 2020 now there is another satellite which is shilanka's first 
indigenous nano satellite called the ravan 1 this was launched successfully into orbit from the international space station right so then another very interesting thing that is happening in the field of space is the introduction of humanoid robots in space right so you have this program for skybot f850 so recently russia sent a humanoid robot known as fedor also the skybot f850 to international space station so the idea of this so humanoid robot is basically a robot which is shaped like human right so the idea is that fedor or skybot f850 will spend 10 days in space to assist astronauts so you you have fedor from let's say russia then you nasa sent up robonaut 2 and then japan also sent up a robot called kiribo now why i am telling you this is because for the gaganyaan mission government of india also plans to send a humanoid robot now that humanoid robot robot is designed to look like a woman therefore she is known as vyom mitra okay so it's only a semi humanoid in the sense it does not have legs but vyom mitra you can google her she has like black hair and then she has like the upper torso is functional so the idea is to have is to send vyom mitra in mangalyaan 1 and mangalyaan 2 missions to look at and observe the effects of the entire mission on humans right so why skybot f80 becomes important is because of the existence of vyom mitra so you should know that skybot f80 russia okay and vyom mitra is india related to mission gaganyaan okay then you have project artemis so up until now all of us have been talking about sending a man on the moon a man on the moon man in space etc right so nasa has come up with a project called project artemis and the idea is to put a woman on the moon by the year 2024 okay then there is another important mission which is the emirates mars mars mission so uae is also not behind and uae is scheduled to launch a spacecraft called the hope spacecraft to study mars so yesterday uae was supposed to launch it but because of bad weather the launch has been postponed so it should happen within this week or the next week then another very interesting mission is the hayabusa 2 mission the hayabusa is a japanese term now it's a very interesting mission in the sense that japan's hayabusa Two is an asteroid sampling aircraft, right? So it had landed on this asteroid named Ryugu asteroid in June 2018. It has collected samples from this asteroid, and it's now began its journey back to Earth. Now, why this is important is that if you look at a lot of academic speculations about space exploration, one of the biggest things that people are talking about is the possibility and the idea of mining of asteroids and other planets, right? Now, obviously, one of the first so we now. this mission has basically displayed that we have the technology to land on asteroids as of now we are getting samples maybe at a later date maybe 15 20 30 years down the line when the proper regulatory mechanism is put in place we can probably have missions which land on asteroids mine commercial quantity of metals etc metals etc from there and then get get them back to earth right so therefore hayabusa 2 mission becomes very important because the future of mankind is predicted will run on elements that we are not even aware of right now okay then you have the solar orbiter mission or the solo mission so basically it's a collaborative mission between the european space agency and nasa it will basically study the development of plants and the emergence of life and how solar system works and it will deal with the larger questions that mankind is facing why do we exist hum kyun hai solar system kaise bana universe kaise bana kyun bana etc and the fundamental physics that work in the universe is what basically the solo mission will aim to study um then you have this another important mission known as the dragonfly mission nasa has planned this dragonfly mission to titan now titan is the largest moon of saturn okay now so these are this is basically which is these are basically the contemporary developments that are happening in space now i want to focus on two other topics mainly the voyager and the chandra x telescope because these are events that happened like long ago but these are historical events of continuing significance as clad consortium puts it okay so recently why voyager 2 was in the news is because voyager 2 probe had developed some form of a technical glitch which nasa had fixed right so there was this spacecraft called voyager 1 and which was followed by voyager 2 this was designed to find and study the edge of our solar system right so the idea was to send these two spacecrafts to keep flying into the space and try to reach the edge of the solar system and give some form of information pictures data etc from the edge of the solar system right now voyager is the only spacecraft which is a, which has studied all the four 
solar system with giant planets which are like the planets that are furthest away from the sun you have jupiter saturn uranus and neptune at low rates okay so the current position of voyager 2 is basically 11.5 billion miles from earth and let me tell you how much the distance is basically light takes 17 hours to reach reach from the voyager to earth now the light from the sun takes only 8 minutes to reach us so now imagine the distance that voyager 2 has traveled since its launch okay so now voyager 2 uses a very interesting technology it gets its power from a radio isotope thermoelectric generator basically there is a radioactive material there and if you know basic science radioactive materials undergo radioactive decay and that decay say jo energy the energy that comes out of that decay is turned into electricity and that power the voyager right because obviously if you are sending an object into the space you can't have it relying on solar energy because ample solar energy might not even reach it so you have to have technology which internally powers this and radioactive active technology is the only some sort of viable technology that we have to have space missions like this in the future right so voyager 2 officially entered interstellar interstellar space in november 2018 interstellar space is basically the space between two stars now this is the space which is not influenced by any of the stars because of it not being in proximity to these stars right because the solar system is the space which is influenced by the sun therefore it is called the solar system now the space between two stars which does not have an influence of any other body is known as the interstellar space right so voyager 1 and voyager 2 are the only human made objects which have entered this interstellar space or this or the so called space between the stars okay then the last thing that i want to discuss today is the chandra x ray observatory now so it is a part of nasa's fleet of great observatories along with the hubble space telescope the spitzer space telescope and the compton gamma ray observatory so basically nasa has launched large space telescopes out of which the hubble space telescope is the most famous one so these are telescopes that are out in the space and their job is to basically have a get a better look at the cosmos right now the spitzer space telescope recently was in the news because it is feared that the spitzer space telescope might run out of power and might become dysfunctional in the next couple of years okay so let's look at the chandra x-ray observatory because there's an indian angle also to it so it was launched by nasa in 1999 so it's been 21 years since it was launched now this telescope is named after the nobel prize winning indian american astrophysicist subramanian chandrasekhar okay now chandra allows scientists from around the world to observe very sharp x-ray images of the cosmos to understand the structure and the evolution of the universe right so it is the most powerful x-ray telescope in the world it is eight times greater resolution and it is able to detect light sources more than 20 times fainter than any other previous x-ray telescope right so this was the important thing about the chandra x-ray observatory and also another very important thing is that the chandra x-ray observatory is the largest and the heaviest payload that has ever been launched by any space shuttle so that's pretty much it that i had to share with you guys today most likely if you have any questions coming out of this this they will be out of these itself i don't think there will be questions beyond these okay so thank you so much for listening thank you so much sir for joining us and taking session on uh, space missions this was uh, quite informative to me as well and to every other aspirant who is preparing especially it was good to know that sri lanka is doing wonderful job with ravana Mm-hmm. Thank you so much sir.